There comes a point when raising children, when that child becomes old enough to look at a parent and say, no. And it's not the word of a, of a young boy who won't take out the dishes, take out the trash or do the dishes. It's not the, the angry word of a teenage girl who doesn't want to stay home. It's the word of another adult who has made a considered decision and they've decided, no, they're not going to do what the parent asks. This is something that always happens and it's part of negotiating a shift in a relationship that has to occur. Every uh, relationship unfolds and develops and changes, and it's always rooted in what comes before, but, but there are always changes that come. This uh, process takes time, and it takes even more time when we're looking at it in the timeline of, of all of Scripture, all of humanity, figuring out, understanding, growing in this relationship with a, with a Heavenly Father. It begins with Noah seeing a rainbow after the flood. That, that's the beginning of this relationship, this covenant of grace, that receive this and live, receive this gift of the promise of the rainbow. And it comes to completion in the life, death, and resurrection of, of Jesus. For in Noah is the beginning after humanity becomes aware of the ability to choose, to choose what is evil, to, to choose against what God wills and then to experience uh, the consequences uh, of this. As with raising any children, at a certain point you, as a parent, you step back and allow p children to experience the consequences of, of their actions. That's just part of growing up. And so this is what happens with humanity. Uh, they grow up over time. So we go from Noah, who's the, the rainbow, and receive this and live, and, and let's start, this, this relationship starts to grow, and from there there's Abraham and, and Moses and, and David, uh, until uh, this relationship, piece by piece, unfolds till we get to Jesus. What we find, what Jesus has to say about this, as he gathers with his disciples around the table, he tells his disciples, uh, he took his place at the table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Just to hear Jesus say eagerly, like Jesus has wanted this for a while. Jesus has wanted uh, th this next step in the same way that parents want their children to grow up. I mean, it's, it's not an easy transition, but it is a transition that you look towards. This is a good thing. This is what we, we desire to have happen. And then Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There it is. There's that term. New covenant. Right? So we've gone through the, uh, the, the covenant of Noah, the Abrahamic covenant, the, the covenant given by, by uh, Moses, the Davidic covenant. And here we get to this point where Jesus has said, now here it is. Here is the new form of this covenant. Here is this new relationship. What happens is such a big deal that it is starting something new. It, it's a break. It, it, just, it was not a given that we would have an Old and, and a New Testament. Uh, why are there? Well, why is there an Old and a New Testament? Right? Why does it just keep on going? Why isn't it just the Bible? Why is it the same God, same people, Rabbi gathering people to speak? I mean, that's what Jew, Jesus is. Like, why is there this break? Right, there's a break here, in a sense, because Jesus tells us there is. There is a new covenant. Jesus says this is a new covenant. And you can only understand the new covenant through understanding what, what had come before. In the same way that any relationship between adult children and parents is based upon the relationship between uh, young children and parents. But to, to, to recognize it, to understand, to grow into this is rooted in, in the past. And so knowing this past, we can see that, for example, circumcision, the way that people have entered the covenant uh, with God before, is now going to be replaced and fulfilled 
in baptism. This is the way that people accept following Jesus. The, the focus on Torah, fulfilling the 613 teachings that we find in the Old Testament, is fulfilled in, in following Jesus, who declares that he has come to fulfill the law. Passover, the story of how God acts to save people bound in slavery, is fulfilled in, in Easter, how God acts to free people bound in sin. And, and so we have to know circumcision and Torah and Passover to then be able to understand baptism and following Jesus in Easter, which is at the, at the core, the basis of, of the new covenant. This is how the book of Hebrews makes sense of who Jesus is. The book of Hebrews, uh, contrary to what uh, it might sound like, it, Hebrews is a book not in the Old Testament, but the New. And, and what it is, is a book that lays out the unfolding relationship. It, it explains, right, that there is a shift that happens. There was this, but now there is this, and it is better. And it fulfills what comes before. The, the book of Hebrews is a book uh, written by Jews to Jews about how this is a better way to be Jewish, in, in a sense. And so we read in the very beginning of Hebrews, uh, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but now he has spoken to us by the Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And so th there's the logic. We, God has spoken by the prophets, but now speaks by a Son. This back and forth, we'll see first then and now, now this. This is what we heard when we read earlier in worship from Hebrews 10. Sacrifices were once made daily, performed by Jewish people to understanding that that is a way to handle uh, sin. Sin causes problems, and the way to respond to, to, uh, to sin is to apologize, and the form of the apology was a sacrifice. And now that Jesus has done what he has done, that is an ultimate sacrifice, a final sacrifice. And so he sits down. Right? That's the language the Hebrews use. He, he, where the priests have to stand every day, stand and stand and stand, Jesus makes this final sacrifice and he sits down because the job is done. Right? That's what... We, so uh, the book of Hebrews then continues. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, what Jesus has done, by the new and living way that he opened us for us, and since, we, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Let us then consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Right? So this sort of lays out, no, no more need to worry about whether we're good enough. Jesus died out of love for us. We approach then with confidence, courageously. And we approach God confidently, that with full assurance of faith, knowing that we are accepted and forgiven and belong. No more do we have to be concerned about that. And so uh, to grapple with this shift that, that this... Uh, John Wesley talks about how in, in former days there was the faith of a servant, the faith of one who wanted to serve and was worried about whether they belonged or, or not. And, uh, the, and John Wesley talked about how we grow up into the faith of a son or a daughter who, who knows and understands and, and is sunk deeply into them, that they, they are saved and there is a belief there uh, that it goes from... It's the difference from uh, doing what you ought to do because you don't want to get in trouble with your parents to doing what you ought to do because you want to see your mother smile. Uh, there's that, a shift that happens here. No more do we need to, to worry about whether we belong. Now we, we can have the confidence and faith that Jesus has done what he has done and, and, and we know we are accepted. And we can do what is right and good and true and proper not out of a fear of whether we deserve, but out of a sense of what, it, what makes Jesus smile, what makes our Heavenly Father happy. And, and that's what uh, 
we see here, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and, and good deeds. That ends up being where we land on this. We provoke each other to love and good deeds so that we live lives that are overflowing with, with the love that we are given. We then allow that to become a way of life that overflows into the lives of those around us. We receive forgiveness and we practice a way of forgiveness. We receive uh, patience and with the fruits of the Spirit and joy and we, we allow that we. We, we allow that to overflow into the lives of those around us. It is important to always remember that this is thus what we receive. It's not what we deserve or work for. It is what we receive. Because remember, this is always a covenant, which as we've un, un, sort of unpacked over the week, a covenant is what receive and live. That's the logic of this covenant. Receive the rainbow and live without fear of, the, of a flood. Receive this land and, and live together as family. Receive this teaching and, and, and live together as God's people. And, and now here's receive this new covenant. And, re, and know that you are forgiven and accepted and loved. And so leave behind fear and, and receive this joy in this confidence that we are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father in this relationship that, that saves us each and every day. Amen.